So I've just got to... There we go. That's good. I've had verbal confirmation the meeting's being recorded. So happy about that. Uh, so welcome everyone. Um, I'm Christine Bellis Kelly. I'm the currently the minister at the Westmead Congregation, which is one of the three congregations of Parramatta Mission. Uh, but I'm also a trainer for domestic family violence, the general um, course that's part of Lifeline. So I'm one of the, the Lifeline trainers for domestic family violence, which has been quite a really interesting journey. Um, there were supposed to be some extra trainings that, were, that I was doing this year. Uh, we're, we're required to do updates all the time, but unfortunately, because of COVID-19, they've all been cancelled. So it's the kind of thing that in relation to domestic family violence, you will have seen extra ads on TV uh, across this time of COVID, and there'll be more... more and more information that's happening. Now, if you don't mind muting your um, screens, everyone, and then what I'll do is I'll go around the room. And as I go around, if you don't mind unmuting, and then you can tell us who you are, uh, which congregation you're from. Does that sound okay? Excellent. So Dulcie, would you like to start? And you'll need, uh, you're already unmuted. Dulcie Court, and I'm from Centenary in Parramatta. Thank you. Min. Um, my name is Min Towner, and uh, I work as a chaplain, and uh, the congregation I'm serving or I'm part of it is Newtown Mission uh, in uh, Newtown, uh, Sydney. Yeah. Thanks, Min. Um, now I've got Alan and Loris, so I'm assuming that's Loris. Yes, it is. I'm Loris. Uh, I'm St Stephen's Uniting in Macquarie Street, Sydney. Hi, welcome. Thank you. Ada, you'll have to unmute. <coughs> okay, Ada Mackay, and I'm the treasurer of uh, Concord Uniting Church. Great to have you Thank here. You. Jan? Me? No, Jan. Oh, sorry. Jan Mullen. Uh, sometimes it's not easy to find the uh, uh -huh. new button. Hi, I'm from Wesley uh, United Church, Castle Hill. Oh, Castle Hill. Hi, Jan. Good to see you. Thanks. Linda, I can, hopefully I can hear you, but not even if I can't see you. Yeah, I'm Secretary at Centenary Parramatta. Thanks. Mm -hmm. uh, Robert. Uh, yes, Robert French, Holroyd Uniting Church. Uh, Casa, Casa, am I saying that right? Yeah, um, I'm from Concord Uniting Church as well. Good to have you here. Thank you. Judith. Um, <coughs> I'm from um, Gindabine, but I'm the co-chair of the Canberra Region Presbytery. Robin. So, I'm from um, Camden Country Uniting Church, which is west of Camden, so in, uh, in rural suburbs. Good to see you again, Robin. I haven't seen you for a long time. It has been. <laughs> you too. Sharon. I'm the um, minister at Liverpool Uniting at the moment. Good to hear you, Sharon, even if I can't see you. <laughs> oh, yeah. Hey, I'm doing you all a favour. <laughs> Not going there. Not going there. I'll be in trouble with your husband. <laughs> Sam. Sam Cho from Kentest Korean Writing Church. Thank you. And Samama. Yes, I am the minister at Milton Alata Uniting Church. Good to have you here. See, one of the advantages of Zoom is that we're able to connect with people in all sorts of places uh, without having to do the travelling. Yeah. So lovely to have you here. I think there might be one or two other people that had planned on joining us, uh, but they're not here as yet. 
So welcome everyone. Um, the purpose of today's workshop is really to try and raise some awareness for everyone in relation to domestic family violence. What I've put together is a PowerPoint that I will be able to share screens so you'll be able to, to um, have a look at that. I'm also happy to make that available um, as a PDF file that I can send out to you or get Mel to send out to you. And in it, there'll be the opportunity for us to think about what domestic family violence is, um, look at some of the resources, um, or, or at least be aware of where some of the key resources are, and then do some thinking about what we can do in relation to being a part of the, the Christian church in dealing with um, this particular issue from the broader sense but also what are some of the things that we can do in a very uh, practical sense because the statistics would show that we have unknown to us or unknown to us members of our congregation that are in situations of domestic and family violence. So does that sound like that's okay? Um, during the session there'll be some bits where I'm explaining things, but there'll also be some times when we'll stop and we'll have conversations along the way. And the plan is that um, we're going to be sticking as close to time as possible. Okay. I understand the practicalities of Zoom is such that sometimes internet drops out. Uh, just come back in if you can. If you're on call like men is, then you have to deal with what you have to deal with. Um, I'd already had a, someone arrive at the front door and it's like, okay. <laughs> uh, so it's, it, it is what it is. And we're doing the best that we can in these circumstances. So does that sound okay, everyone? Yep. Okay. Beautiful. Now, um, so what I've got on the screen is to recognise that as a uniting church, we have started to do some work in relation to how we as a whole church can begin to speak into and act into in a positive way in the area of domestic and family violence. The president, Deirdre Palmer, has um, been part of a group and has been working very much in this area. Mel Pivalu has been connecting with Deirdre and some of the others from the other synods. And Mel and I have been working with a few others to develop a workshop and a handbook um, for our synod in particular. Uh, and we've prepared it and we're just waiting for some of the things to get worked through. So for some of us, we take this very seriously. Uh, I know that at the moment we're in a pandemic uh, but for a number of years, I've been talking about domestic and family violence as being an epidemic. Mm. Uh, it is often accepted by people as this is just the way that it is. And the destructive influences of domestic and family violence in um, our society is really um, something that we're mostly not aware of. Or that we think, oh, yeah, well, that's just the way it is. We can't speak into it. But hopefully out of some of these workshops, um, people will be able to recognise, oh, hold on, we can actually begin to make a bit of a difference mm -hmm. to this epidemic of, of violence. So uh, now I've just got to work out. My ordinary computer um, has, was challenged in that it um, decided to not work. And so I'm in the process of trying to work out how to, there we go. So, um, what sort of things do you know about domestic and family violence? Maybe you might have one element that you might like to um, just speak into or, or just raise. So this is, this is not a rhetorical question. This is a question for everyone to be able to say something if they want to. Well, I have a friend who's um, experienced um, <clears throat> not necessarily physical, but certainly psychological and fin financial um, violence. Um, the 
<coughs> the perpetrator has died now and um, I'm helping her in the recovery phase. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Thank you. Anyone else? I, I think yeah. for me that domestic violence is very much, uh, first of all, is uh, the perspective, the definition from each person, look at what, the, what does it mean to them about domestic violence. And in my experience that domestic violence, the, the, the most challenging is uh, in cost culture, because that cost culture, that is a fine line that uh, how can we help that person to understand that in the Western culture, domestic violence is very different from where they come from. And so it's really um, the fundamental uh, to help them to understand what the definition in our point of view from the Western point of view. Yeah. Yeah. And, and um, I've got a story that I'll share later, but I think that one of the most vulnerable groups, and there's a number, but one of them is those that come from cultural and linguistically diverse backgrounds, mm -hmm. and especially in that resettlement process. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thanks, man. Anyone else? One of the um, uh, things that we always associate with domestic, domestic and family violence is that it's women who are the uh, victims, but it's really, and, and overwhelmingly they are, but it's really easy to lose sight of the fact that men are also victims. Um, and I actually know a man who is, and um, in our discussions, um, even even in the literature, it almost always diverts to women, as it should because of the huge numbers, but I really feel that men are being forgotten about and left behind on this issue. And, and I think um, I'll show you some, some statistics later on where men are, um, are not forgotten. Uh, the government has tended to give the funding towards the prevention of violence towards the women and the children. So Lifeline, for example, what we run is very specifically funded for the women and children. However, those of us that are trainers always talk about uh, the, you know, the violence that's experienced by men and by children. And it can, and it can be insane gendered relationships as much as it can be in heterosexual relationships. So we do need to keep that in our mind as well. Now, Robert, I think I saw your hand popping up at one stage. I, yeah, I just feel that it's a cycle, like domestic violence is a cycle. It's breaking that cycle that we've got to look at and replacing it with something that's more valuable and more harmonious and more, more peaceful. I think that's a helpful insight there, Robert. Anyone Hello. else? Oh, Aiden, of, um, Sharon, I can't see you for a hand, so you'll have to speak in. Thank you. I watched the line. Um, one of the things that I, I'm i very much aware of, uh, going back to the uh, men who, are, who experience domestic violence, is that they are basically emasculated, if that's the right word, because they are men. And it's because men don't really want to admit that some of the times the women are more powerful and stronger than they are. And they just, if they say anything, they come across as being some form of weakling, especially, and women will talk to women, but if a man is experiencing um, domestic violence, he's less likely to talk to his mates about it because that way he's not seen as a man's man sort of thing. He's seen as someone who just lets the woman ride all over the top of him. So the actual figures and the stats for male domestic violence um, is way off the mark because simply because it's not reported. So there's a couple of things you picked up there, Sharon, and um, we could go on for all day probably with what we know, excuse me. Um, but one of the things I think is recognizing uh, that this is about power. So power is one of the key factors in relation to domestic and family violence. So I think that's really important that we keep that in mind. The other thing is to recognize that there are societal influences that impact upon the way that we understand, the way that we see, and the way that we actually set up people to fail in relation to a whole range of areas, but very specifically in domestic and family violence. So as we move on, I'm gonna work out how to advance this next little bit. Um, the normal PowerPoint doesn't work in the same way here. 
So it's, there we go. Um, so one of the things that we need to recognise that, is that domestic and family violence is actually preventable. But the energy that needs to go into bringing about some changes in society and changes in the cultures that we have within society, and I'm not talking about linguistically diverse cultures, I'm talking about just general cultures, um, it is, requires quite a financial commitment. It requires a lot of energy and a lot of, um, a lot of focus on actually challenging the status quo and for the people that tend to be in situations of power, uh, that makes it very difficult because they're quite happy with the status quo as it is. So we do talk about this as a preventable um, aspect of life, but it does require a lot of energy to go into it. Now, one of the things that the government has done is, uh, and the impetus has come from so many people saying we need to change this is the development of a group called our watch and there's a whole series of resources that are available if you and you just google our watch uh, and you can see that our watch stands for end violence against women and their children uh, and this has support from the government but again as i said the funding is very much focused just on the women and children and there's a reason for that. Uh, but our watch has really helpful video snippets about the gender inequality that we experience in life. Uh, and for the, from the international perspective, a lot of domestic and family violence actually comes about because of gender inequality. Uh, and the gender inequality starts right from the word go. And so there's a lovely, um, challenging video to watch on the Our Watch site that has been updated. Um, it was put out a few years ago and then they've just done a, a new release that talks about some of the gendered influences that we have um, in relation to the gender inequality and how that impacts upon, um, upon our relationships, upon the power side of things. And uh, there are also some other really helpful resources on this particular website in relation to domestic family violence that have been put together by people who've experienced it, who've worked with it, and who are passionate about trying to change, trying to change the story. Um, one of the things that um, I think is quite interesting is to recognize that there is a difference in the way that society does treat women and men. And the statistics around that are um, multitude. I'm not wanting to get into that too much, but I do want to highlight that as far as the broader world um, organisations that are dealing with domestic family violence are concerned, this is mainly a gender inequality situation. And it's comes back to the way that power is enacted in a relationship. The thing I need to say and be quite upfront about it is that there are very toxic relationships out there. And some of those toxic relationships are quite violent. Mm -hmm. uh, however, in some of those toxic violent relationships, the power dynamic or the power differential is the same. So there's an equality around that. When we talk about domestic family violence, we're talking more about the power of one person over another. Mm. And so that does change the dynamic a little bit. Mm. So I do encourage you, have a look at our watch. There's plenty of resources there that are quite helpful. Um, there's also uh, a number of hotlines and places that you can go, but probably the, the key one to remember is the 1-800-RESPECT. And that's probably the easiest to remember, 1-800-RESPECT. And that's the one that is very much focused on domestic and family violence. But you can see that there are men's referral services, etc. We've got building work happening across the road, so I'll put a lot of dust around. Um, the other thing that I've noticed in this time of COVID-19 is that not only are the ads 
speaking about domestic and family violence, but they're also encouraging men to get help if they're in a situation where they're feeling that they want, they're, um, they're wanting to be violent or wanting to act against someone uh, that's an intimate partner or within their family. So that's been really encouraging because I haven't seen any of those ads um, or, or any of that kind of advertising except in this COVID-19 period. So we're actually in a unique time in history in relation to domestic and family violence as well. So um, Lifeline is of course an important one to remember and one of the other, um, one of the higher risk factors for people is if they come from Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander background and there's a specific hotline for, um, for them, the 1800 019 123. Um, so you can see just from there and there are other sources available, there are other referral places available but this is something that uh, it's really good that we've got these resources, but recognising that there are more resources that we need as well. Now, before I go on to um, some of the statistics, one of the reasons that we call, talk about domestic and family violence um, is not just about the physical sense of things. The word violence makes you think that there's a physical interaction that's happening. Does anyone know why we use the term violence? Repeat the question. Repeat the question. Oh, sorry. Um, so Min was saying that the slideshow is not, not showing. Sorry, I'll try and get that. Uh, I will send it out. It's, it's, I'm having trouble getting it on the thing. Um, does anyone know why we use the term domestic and family violence? Because violence makes us think of the physical, but why the word violence? Is it because violence um, we all assume is a is a a body touching a body part touching another body part, but you can actually have a, a violent suggestion, one that violates the person's um, feelings or sense of person, as much as punching someone in the face. Sorry to be blunt, but yep. to me they're they're both violent, but they're both very different. Yeah. That's a good point. Um, anyone else? And is that showing on the screens yeah. now? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Is it because it's a war situation? No. No? Okay. One of the things we talk about is that, and the reason that we use violence, and, and Sharon was starting to get onto this, is because violence is actually about the violation of human rights. We have the human, uh, the Charter of Human Rights that we pulled together quite a long time ago. And so we use the word violence, it's a violation of our human right to have autonomy of our own body and for a number of other things. And so I will go through some of those later. Um, but hopefully you can see that screen now with those contact numbers, yep. Mm -hmm. And don't forget, I will, I will get Mel to send this out as um, a PDF afterwards so that you'll have all the slides. But the key one I want you to have is the 1800 respect. Okay, so when we talk about domestic and family violence, we need to understand it's a violation of our human rights for self autonomy, for um, decisions about our own bodies. And there are a number of other of the elements or the, the um, aspects of the Charter of Human Rights that are being violated in situations of domestic violence. So it is not just the physical violence and we will go through the list in a little while. But I, I wanted to at least say, look, we've got a whole heap of resources to start off with before we start getting down into this deeper space. So we right to move on? Yep. Yes. So, here are some very, very sad statistics. In 2019, these are the figures that we have in Australia. 
of people that were killed by a partner or a family member. Um, that's more than one woman a week. For men, it's every few weeks. And for children, it's about once every two weeks, if you look at it that way. Mm. What, I don't know whether you can remember, but very recently there was a situation where the father killed his wife and children up in Queensland. And even yesterday, uh, there were a number of stories that were in the news in relation to um, a woman that had been killed by her brother or allegedly killed by her brother and recognising that um, that's still getting sorted through. So it's not always husband, wife, it's not always, um, you know, parent, child, but the majority of times it is. The thing is, it's not just about uh, situations where someone dies. The impact of domestic family violence is across the board in so many other ways. The chart on the right hand side comes from a group called ANROWS, A-N-R-O-W-S. Again, that's a good resource to look up on the internet so that you're able to find more information. This chart um, goes back to 2017, 2018, uh, because it takes time for the statistics to be able to be put together. The figures from last year are, were due to come out at the end of this month. But because of COVID-19, um, there's a whole heap of things that are being readjusted at the moment. Uh, domestic family violence is probably one of the highest causes uh, or factors why women and children are homeless in Australia. So up on that uh, top left-hand corner of the chart on the right-hand side, the homelessness. Um, so. 2017, 2018, 72 and a half um, thousand women were, um, hold on, I've got people wanting to come in, were, um, were in the situation of wanting to, or having to leave home. Now, let me just see. No. So it's the kind of thing that, um, that you can see from that chart how challenging it is when domestic family violence impacts upon homelessness, it impacts upon the health situations of people, it impacts it just across the board in so many ways. It's one of the significant factors for children in being um, left behind in relation to schooling uh, and all sorts of things that come about because of the domestic and family violence. So this just starts to give us a bit of a factor of how it impacts upon people's lives, both men and women and, and also children. So it's, it's pretty horrifying seeing these kinds of figures, but it's also, I'm also mindful that it's, um, it's the reality that we face. This particular map uh, gives a bit of an overview of New South Wales. The darker the colour, the higher the incidence of domestic family violence per 100,000 people in the population. Now, because I've expanded it, you can't read it so well, but if you look towards the um, bottom right-hand corner, you can see that Blacktown area, or local government area, is the highest area in Sydney. And then you can see I can't see it anymore. I oh, can't see it, okay. Sorry, it just keeps doing this funny thing. Uh, and some of it may be operator error and some of it may be, there we go. Can you see it now? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Cool. Um, so you can see that there is higher incidence in rural areas. And that's one of the things that's been shown by a lot of the figures that have come in from across the um, police commands and the kinds of call outs that they get, probably uh, in New South Wales, the highest number of call outs that police have every year is to do with domestic and family violence. And you can actually um, have a look into the police statistics. So it takes a little while to get there, but you can look at them and you start to see, oh, hold on, this is actually 
this is actually far more than just my neighbor or someone you know that i know this is actually across the whole of society and when we look at this map we can see how prevalent it actually is in new south wales okay <laughs> Come on, you can do it. Okay, sorry. I'm gonna have to change that for a little bit. So does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Yep. Um, I'm just trying to get the next slide. And it doesn't help, I'm not using my normal computer, so it's, there we go. So, some of the ways that we stop family violence is actually about how we can engage with some of the causes. And there are a whole range of myths around family violence. Uh, and the only way we can understand it is actually by having some form of education in relation to it. So I just want to highlight four of the myths. There's many of them, but these are the four key ones. What do you think about this particular question? Why, why doesn't she just leave? And I'll come out of stop share for that one. Because women um, are often financially dependent. Um, they have children that they have to look after. They don't know where to go. They don't know the resources that are available to them. Um, they may not have the necessary prerequisite documentation to be able to leave. So they may not have a passport. They might not even have a driver's license. Um, they may have no access to identifying who they are and um, sort of what their family, who their family is because everything's been controlled by the husband or the partner. Um, so, and because they don't know what they can do and how to do it, and they're afraid often to talk to people, um, they just figure it's easier to stay than, than to go because they're going to face more problems, particularly if they've got very young children that they've got to look after. Yeah, and they're all really, really good points. And what it highlights is that for the process of leaving, there's a lot of things that need to be thought through. Uh, and, and a plan does need to be made whether someone is staying or whether someone is going. It's not easy to leave. Any other ideas about why she would, about this myth about why doesn't she just leave? She still she, loves her partner. Yeah, she still loves, he, but he loves me and he's always sorry. Mm -hmm. Or she loves me and she's always mm -hmm. sorry. Mm -hmm. Mim. Uh, I think that um, sometimes people are comfortable, I know that it sounds weird, but comfortable with the known, even that known environment that is so bad, but is the known that they feel comfortable and feel safe, then leaving, you are facing the unknown that they never had to deal before. So yeah. you know, in the domestic violence, you know, the partner know that this is a bad anger, but at least I know how to deal with it. Yes, but if I yes. step outside of this environment, I don't know how to deal, even is a better environment for me. Yeah, yeah. Th and that, that's a really good point. Ada, and you'll have to unmute. Um, partners, um, violent partners often convince um, the, the <clears throat> their partner that they, <clears throat> they couldn't cope. They couldn't cope. Um, if they left, and that's what happened to my friend. Mm. She was firmly convinced that she couldn't manage if she yeah. left. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So what we're finding is that there's lots of different reasons that people have for staying. Uh, and it's not just one reason, there's lots of reasons. But one of the highest risk factors for, um, and I will use the statistics and, and focus this on one of the highest um, areas of risk for a woman to leave a situation of domestic family violence is that that's actually when it can tip over to the point where um, she can end up, being, end up dying. So leaving 
is actually one of the highest risk factors for women. Uh, it's also the same for men, but the figures, as Sharon had rightly said earlier on, the men, it's hard to know those figures. Uh, we don't get good reporting uh, as much as we know that things happen because of the fear factor, because of the lack of access to be able to report. And, and that's one of the things that's happening with COVID-19. For a lot of people, the access to be able to talk to someone outside that intimate family um, has been so significantly reduced by the working at home aspects. So it's actually very dangerous and it takes, um, I think they talk about the average of seven to 13 attempts to leave before a person can actually leave. That's a lot. And I know from my own experience how frustrating it can be when to me it seems so obvious you just need to leave him. But all of these factors come into play. So it is quite a myth in relation to, um, in relation to that. One of the other myths is, get the right button. It's a bit of a delay using Zoom, I think. Come on, you can do it. She must have done something to deserve this. What do you think about that one? That's a myth perpetrated by the um, um, person who's um, delivering the violence in whatever form it is. Um, and it, I think it's an historical thing that goes back centuries where um, men were seen as being the dominant partner, the one who made the decisions, and women had to fit into a particular mould and a particular uh, framework and definition and... Um, because women were actually non, in, in a sense, non-citizens, they didn't have rights. Um, if something went wrong, it was the woman's fault because she was the man's property and it's been per, um, perpetuated down through the time. And I think that is a fair thing to say. It's not the only thing. Um, one of the things that uh, we teach in the general domestic family violence thing with Lifeline is that there is often a cycle of violence. And I know over the years, having met people who um, I've heard the comments from others saying, oh, well, she deserves it because um, of the way that she speaks to him. But sometimes in the cycle of violence, when you know what's coming, women will actually, or, and men, will actually act in a particular way to bring it on and then it's over and done with. Mm. And it's a way of managing that cycle of violence. And so I think that there's, there's a lot of factors in around this. Um, one quick story, um, in Westmead, we've run a cafe and a lady came in a particular time um, and she was at work and she just had a quick lunch break. She had to get up at four o'clock every morning to make sure that the downstairs toilet was immaculately clean for when her husband got up at five o'clock or whenever. Um, because otherwise he would be violent towards her. And I said, well, can't you wait until he goes to bed and then do it then? She said, no, he makes me go to bed first. And I can't sneak out because otherwise I'll end up in more trouble. So the only way I can manage this is to get up at four o'clock in the morning and clean the downstairs toilet immaculately. And even when it's immaculate, if he's in the wrong mood, I, I pay for it. Uh, to speak to this person, well-educated, working, professional, everything together. But that story just spoke into the situation of this power differential that, um, where in her particular case, her husband chose to be violent towards her. Wasn't violent to anyone else in his life, mm. just violent towards her. And that's one of the elements of domestic family violence that, that we need to... Um, to keep in mind. So she must have done something to deserve this. 99.9% .9 of the time, we can say that's actually totally wrong. And the 1% comes about because we as human beings have doubt. And it's actually not about their situation, it's about our biases, our unconscious bias towards people. So this is a myth. And uh, interestingly, in the majority of cases, 
um, people who who used um, violence against intimate or family members don't act in that way towards anyone else. Uh -oh. It's a family or a private matter. Oh, we see me. I just say. Uh, uh, in in the case, uh, I, th I thank you for sharing that uh, story about that lady, and um, um, I used to help out uh, support in the support group for domestic violence, and a lot of people, even they are highly educated, like you say, but they don't know who they are themselves. They have to find their own self. They need to accept themselves because often they they so low self esteem regardless that they have such a high demand job and doing so well in their workforce. But because they see themselves that I don't deserve more than what I'm getting now. So they stay in that. So we, like a, a lot of time that we're counseling, help them to find their own identity, that their value for themselves. Mm -hmm. And that helped them to move forward a little bit. Yeah. yeah. And one of the things that we've seen over recent years is that there's a range of ads on TV that are starting to speak into the way that people see themselves. Um, I don't know whether you can remember, but there was a series of ads where um, a father was picking up kids from school and in the back there was a girl yeah. and, um, you know, the, the boy was late. Oh, why were you late? Oh, because I've been looking up, you know, because I was looking up, I flicked up a girl's skirt or something and the dad says oh is that all and then the daughter says in the background it's all right dad she's doing something on a pad or whatever it's all right dad I fully expect that when I grow up people will be dismissive of me as a female as well mm -hmm. and then I expect that by the age of 15 I will be have will be sexually harassed and blah 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 and the dad goes oh so some of these things, that's, that's why I was saying earlier, this is some cultural, societal elements that come in about how we, we do that. Um, and as, especially for those of us that are females, uh, we have expectations laid upon us and ways that we've been looked at and continue to be looked at from a society perspective, which means that we tend to aim towards blaming ourselves than to actually look at the situation and say, well, actually, no, no one deserves to have this kind of thing happen. So it's, it's a really challenging kind of situation. One of the, the big challenges, and this comes across from generational perspective, um, but also cultural language perspective, is that what happens in the home stays in the home. It's a private matter. And that's enabled things to happen over the years that have been absolutely horrific. Um, many years ago, um, I was in a conversation about with a group of males who were looking to come and to, at that stage, they were looking to join the Uniting Church. And as the process went about, um, Sharon, John and I, your husband, John and I, had met with this particular group of men and uh, they didn't know that John's a lay person and I'm an ordained person. We didn't specify that at all. But we had this conversation with the men and, and John asked a beautiful, curious question. They come from a particular country overseas and he said to them, what's been one of your most difficult situations in coming and settling into Australia? And they said, our wives have learned how to dial triple zero. Yes. And I said, sorry? Yes. And they said, our wives have learnt to dial, dial triple zero. And I clicked on what was happening. And John said, what do you mean? And they said, well, when we choose to discipline our wives, um, they've, here in Australia, uh, they call the police. And they're saying, we can't discipline them in the way that, you know, we did back in whatever country it was. And it was quite interesting. I mean, the conversation continued about a few other things. And um, once they realised that we ordained women in the Uniting Church, um, <laughs> and they realised that I was actually the ordained person, not John, um, it became a little bit more uncomfortable for them. But it, it struck both John and myself 
that this sense of sense of men disciplining their wives uh, was the way that they saw it. So very unfortunately, people of faith use their sacred texts mm. as a way of um, being violent towards other people. One of the partners. Sorry, Christina. And I see that time and time and time again. Yes, yeah, Sharon, go. One of the um, conversations I had with some of the women after that was um, talk, them talking to me about the sense of freedom that Triple O gives them. Yeah. It, it gives them freedom, but it, as well as the freedom it gave them, it helped to improve their identity because their identity was no longer that in their culture they were the bad wife because the husband had to take discipline. Um, the identity changed then to someone who could actually have some form of control over her own destiny and what somebody else was allowed or virtually not allowed to do to her anymore. And there was a huge sense of freedom from the women yep. about that one. Yep. Yes, that was. And, and so what it did was it highlights that people will use their faith and use their scriptures to justify bad behaviour. Mm. And we have seen that in apartheid. We have seen that in a whole range of ways that scriptures have been abused. Uh, and we do see this in domestic and family violence as well. And right towards the end of the slideshow, uh, there's a website that you can go to that has some brilliant resources around how we read the scriptures, some Bible studies that you can use, and, and some of the ways that we within the faith setting can actually bring about some culture change. Uh, and um, I find that that's a really helpful resource to have. So the private matter um, is why so many older women and men that I've connected with over my ministry, and I've been in ministry 30 years now, um, would start to talk to me about what had happened all those years ago. And they said, but it was a private matter. The other thing that's, that saddens me greatly is that there are many, many, many examples of domestic and family violence within the households of people who are in leadership within the church. So ministers, elders, and other leaders use domestic and family violence in those situations. Now, um, I, when I was growing up, the what form of discipline that my family had um, was that we used to get belted. Uh, initially, it was the hand, um, as in my parents' hand. Then it was the wooden spoon till it got broken on one of my brothers. Uh, then it was the dog lead, and then it was the jug cord. And I do remember being in year, the equivalent of year 12, or 11 or 12, with the nice little loop from where the loop of the jug cord had come around, and that was on my leg. Those days, that was considered to be, oh, that's just how you discipline your kids. But if that was what we did today, that's actually abuse. Mm -hmm. And so my mother and I have had some really interesting conversations over the years about that form of discipline. And I chose to not discipline my children that way. And uh, I do remember the last time she said to me, but it never hurt you. When I responded, she began to see... It was less about the physical hurt. It was the psychological hurt. It was the emotional hurt. It was the sense of hurt to my self-esteem. And the list went on. So she and I have had some really interesting conversations over the years. But I also recognise that that back then was seen as, okay, that's how you discipline your kids. Uh, and sadly, that's also the way that children are still being disciplined today. And of course, it doesn't stop the bad behaviour. In fact, it normalises the physical violence uh, and leads to further consequences down the track. So, so it is um, a real challenge for people uh, in relation to the um, in relation to the um, domestic family violence. Um, and why these don't work? Does that matter? Yeah. 
Another myth is domestic family violence doesn't affect children. And this is something that was actually said by those that were doing the training um, and the educators. And one of the things that they were talking about was if they don't see it, then it's not going to impact upon them. Well, what we know now is domestic family violence has a really significant impact upon children. It impacts upon them. Um, one of the highest risk factors is a woman who is pregnant or up until 12 months after the baby's born. The number of children that have um, been impacted in utero because of domestic family violence is quite high. The number of small children who have actually died as a result of some of the things that have happened in the domestic family violence situation. And then the unmeasurable or immeasurable impact upon children of what happens when they see or experience um, family violence. We tend to use domestic violence more for the term of the intimate partner so the husband or the wife, and we tend to use family violence for other members of the family that are impacted. But for Aboriginal communities, they tend to just pull it all together as family violence because it impacts the whole family. So children do not have to be in the same room to be impacted by family violence. It, it changes the way they see themselves. They develop um, mental health disorders in a really high rate, uh, their self-esteem is impacted, where do they go to gain healthy models of parenting for themselves or who it is to be a male or who it is to be a female and Sharon you talked earlier about the emasculization that had happened with a lot of men in those kind of circumstances. The anger that a lot of young people have is quite significant and what how that impacts upon them on a physical sense is really high. When we do the training for Lifeline, we have a video that was put together by um, one of the, I think it was Victorian or South Australian governments, and it was put together by children who had been through counselling situations and support. They wrote the script, they acted the script out, and when you see it, it's like, Oh, wow, we then understand how much they see, take on board, and the insight that they gain as to themselves when they've had appropriate help. But children are impacted in such a highly negative way that we can't even begin to measure that. We just know that it's across the board. Their sense of spirit, their sense of self, their physical, their emotional, um, illness, anxiety, the, the list just goes on and on. So it's something that we need to keep very mindful. And the law has changed. So one of the areas of the law that's come into play is that someone can be charged in, in relation to domestic and family violence for um, simply because they are um, their children are around and have been affected. So they don't have to be in the same room, but they can be affected by domestic family violence. And that's a really important point for us to know. So Kasa is coming in. So nice to have you here, Kasa. So there's some of the myths that we have. And one of the things that we need to recognize is that um, this does impact in far more ways than most people realize. What we also need to remember is that not all men are violent. Not all domestic family violence is perpetrated by men. And it is about the power and control. And one of the things that I'm aware of is that this power and control in relationships does tend to flex anyway. But of course that changes depending upon the particular situations. And what we're really talking about is one person having greater control and increasing control over another person over a period of time. So the government talks about domestic family violence as any behavior that's violent, threatening, controlling, or intended to make you or your family feel scared and unsafe. 
there are lots of definitions, but this is the one that I think uh, picks up on um, the threats, the control, the violence, but the intention, the intention to make someone else feel unsafe or scared. And some of the other resources, um, and this differentiates again between the intimate partner and um, the family or family member. So the situation yesterday was um, a woman that had been killed allegedly by her brother as they were living together. So that would come under what we call about, uh, what we refer to as family violence. So here we, we start to look at some of the different forms and these are the nine main areas that we look at. Physical violence can be from pushing and shoving, um, holding someone's hand in a particular way or their wrist or, you know, any kind of physical element to it. Um, and sometimes it can even be, um, and the stories that we tell of um, a couple being in the room together and the male just starts tapping his fingernail on the desk. And that is enough control for the female to then move right back into a very threatened position. So physical goes from simple things that the tapping on the desk portrays the threat that's coming right through to um, the physical side of things, which, um, and at the other extreme, of course, it is death. Financial and economic is one of the other areas. And um, interestingly, one of the ads I saw last night on TV was talking about, oh, it's really good now, um, now that I can control her spending. And that came up just on one of the ads yesterday. And, and so the financial economic side of things is, is something that's really important for us to remember as well. That includes the control of the finances to the point where the other person is limited in what they're being able to do. Now, I need to say that in my household, I'm the one that basically manages the finances, but it's not an abusive relationship. It is this power um, situation where we're able to, to be together. But the financial economic kind of thing comes into play when one person has all of the control and will not let the other person have any kind of control in relation to that. Uh, and earlier on, I think um, Loris was talking about even the simple uh, um, challenge of not being able to leave because you don't have any access to, to money or to bank accounts or bank statements. And what do you need to st open a bank account these days? 100 points of identification. So if you've got someone that controls the documentation, you can't even go and open a bank account. There are so many stories I know of women who are allowed to have a certain amount of money and they have to account for every single cent of that. And that's, that's what we're talking about with financial and economic um, uh, control and violence. There are also those that are not allowed to work because if they're going out to work, it means they've got perhaps some financial independence and they've got some networks as well. So finance can, can really start to limit. And there are some situations where the women are sent out to work, but there are really strict guidelines about what they can and what they can't do, you know, and how they can spend their money, etc. So financial economic is one that we see quite a lot and we need to uh, have an awareness about that. We're probably more aware of the sexual violence and we would often hear of situations where um, women would speak about having been raped by their husbands and then in um, courts and, and the thoughts of a lot of people, oh, you can't be raped by your husband. Actually, you can. Mm. And this comes back to the violation of human rights. One of the human rights is that we have the right to say what happens to our own body. And uh, no means no, whether we're married or not married or whatever. And so sexual violence does happen in all sorts of ways. And it's not just, um, it's not just 
rape at one extreme, there's a whole heap of other ways it can come into play, uh, including um, people being asked to perform sexual acts that they're not comfortable with and being pressured to do so. So we need to be aware that this still is part of what happens. But um, originally, I think for a lot of people thinking domestic violence was really about the, um, the bashing, the murder, and the, the sex side of things. Now we have a much greater understanding that it's about far more things than just that. Verbal abuse is something that we're much more aware of. Uh, and verbal abuse can happen in toxic relationships or when any of us is tired or in COVID-19 times when we're feeling extra stressed because we've been locked up inside with each other in all sorts of ways. But the verbal abuse also goes to the point of where people are being put down. And this is one of the challenges for the children. So domestic family violence where a child is made to feel little or, a, or an adult is made to feel little or small or demeaned uh, very much comes on to this verbal abuse. Have you heard of lamplighting? Mm. Yeah. So lamplighting, there's an there's a interesting movie with Doris Day many, many years ago. And in it, the lamplighting is um, using, there's, there's no physical abuse, but it's using the, the words to basically get someone to question their own sanity. Mm. Uh, and it is a form of abuse. And, and in, it's a verbal abuse in that it's so manipulative and so subtle, but it's designed to demean and to diminish the other person. And so verbal abuse has quite a range within it, but it's something that uh, we would probably see more often than not. Uh, quick story, I was down at Parramatta one day and um, I was in the, at a big intersection um, and I could hear a couple of people yelling at each other and what the man was saying to the female was absolutely atrocious. And I was, she's trying to get away from him and, and he kept grabbing hold of her and pulling her back. And, and I'm trying to think, what do I do in that situation? And it was, it was not nice at all. And I'm thinking, what do I do as a female? Um, you know, and, and how do I maintain my own safety? So. I stood on the opposite side of the street. I had my phone in hand and I had it like this. And I just stood there and did this and watched them. And often if you're being watched, you'll turn around, to, you just have a sense someone's watching you. There were two other women that stood not near me, but in different spaces. So the three of us were like a triangle around this couple where this guy was being so verbally abusive towards the woman and it was starting to, to become more physical. And then all of a sudden he looked up and he saw me. Um, I had two lots of cars and a road between him and me. So I felt a little bit safe and I knew my escape route. Uh, he saw me and the glare that he gave me was quite um, interesting. But then when he looked around, he saw two other women there, all like this with our phones and he stopped and he walked away. But the verbal abuse, and what was being said was part of his escalation in, and we could see the physical violence was starting to come about. Mm -hmm. so, so often the physical and the verbal come very closely together. Christine, um, yeah? one comment, one, one question, the question yeah. quickly, um, lamplighting is the same as gaslighting? Uh, gaslighting, yeah, same mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, the question is, um, isn't there a concern, and, and I'm not trying to say we shouldn't do something, yep. but I've seen something similar. And in your own mind, it's not just your own um, uh, welfare that you're concerned with when you see a situation like that. Yep. But when the woman gets home, the fear that she's actually going to cop it a whole lot worse because he got mm. stopped doing mm. what he was doing. Yeah. And I yeah. think that's an enormous strain and pressure on yep. everybody who's witnessing because, you know, you might be protecting her there but you could be sending her to a, a worse fate when she gets home. And yeah. I, I just find it really difficult to, to work yeah. out exactly where to stand on that. Yeah. And, and it is really hard. And one of the things is that women who, have ex, who are experiencing domestic and family violence um, and are still alive are actually very strong. They must be doing something right to survive. 
And having spoken to one more recently, um, and I told that story to her, and she said, do you know what something like that would do to me? She would, she said, even though I knew I'd get the belting, I'd get the belting irrespective of whether something happened or not, but I knew there were women out there that saw what happened. I knew I wasn't alone. Mm. So sometimes I think it's really important that we, we do. And in this situation, there, there may not be a reason, you know, they're, they're going to get the belting anyway, is the way that some of them say. Uh, and so what we can do is actually try and do what we a little bit to show we see you, we notice what's going on, you're not alone, even if we can't change the circumstance. Because the only one that can change that circumstance is actually the woman in that particular circumstance or the man in another circumstance. But to do that, they need great strength, they need plans, and they need professional support, specialist support to be able to leave. The emotional, psychological, we're very aware of, the, the lamplighting, gaslighting um, fits into that as well. And a lot of the belittling behaviour that comes in to domestic family violence is a part of that as well. Social, um, what do you think I mean by social? Yeah, Christine? Yeah, Robert? Um, the point you made up about when you see it happen is interesting because I've, I've intervened in three or four cases where there have been a range of things I could do from just call the police. Whatever you do, don't do nothing. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Call the police. It's on record. The per you don't know what state that person is in. Early years when I was in the NRMA and driving around, I'd see a lot of things. Um, early years, you would intervene. These days, you're, you're actually dealing with people that are so psychotic, you can't talk sense to them. Yeah. Holding up the phone can enrage them. Yeah. Holding up the phone can stop them. You don't know. So um, all I suggest is the minimum thing you do is ring the police and say, I have a concern for welfare, welfare, take some details, maybe even follow them a little bit so you can help the police find out where it's happening. Yeah. Um, in times when I have come face to face with people, men, a man that's dealing with them, I would tell them, if you don't let go of the woman, I'm calling the police. Yeah. So my main concern with domestic violence that I see on the street was that the woman did have a chance to get away. And in those three cases that I'm talking about, they were being held by the man. Yeah. And um, so my main point was, let her go, let her go. I will, I'm calling the police now. I didn't say I was going to. I'm calling the police now. Let her go. And, and inevitably, the woman would say, I'm all right. And I'd re put it back to the man. I'd say, you must let her go. I'm not leaving until you let her go. In other words, giving her some free will to do something, to either run to us or anything like that. Yeah. The last time was very scary when this man with no shirt came up to my front door and I'm half expecting a punch through the window, in which case you have to change your tack and you have to turn around and say, this isn't the sort of person you want to be, is it? So you because he's not interested in the, in the he's interested in, in how he's feeling, not how she's feeling. Yeah. So that's just my, my yeah. experiences. Yeah. And I think as a male, Robert, you are able to do things that we as fe the rest of us as females aren't able to do. Um, Sam, there are things that you may be able to do, uh, but I know as a female, there are some limits to what we can do and safety, our own safety, as well as the safety of the other person is, is something that's absolutely paramount. The police, um, the main source of being called out is the physical assault or assault for domestic family violence. Um, the other highest number of cases that the New South Wales Police got called out for last year was breaches of apprehended violence orders. And the um, third area, again, was something that was linked in with stalking. So the three key areas are to do with domestic and family violence. And we're talking a lot of call-outs. We're talking about a really high percentage of call-outs for police in relation to domestic family violence situations. And they're more than happy to be called out in situations to come and help 
as much as they can. They get frustrated by this as well, but they also understand. Um, social aspects is very much about where um, bit by bit the control comes around so that the limitation, the person is limited in who they're able to be in contact with. This can actually reduce the contact a person may have with their family or with their friends. Um, you have to stay home and look after the kids. You can't go out. It can be removing any source of, um, of ways for someone to be able to contact anyone outside the home. And so gradually, bit by bit, the, the whole um, social network of someone is getting narrower and narrower and narrower. And so social side of things is, is um, something that's really important. Or it can be very limiting, um, like, yeah, sure, come on out, but we're going to this place, we're going to see these people, and you're not to say a thing. And so from a social perspective, it's really talking about how um, the power and control is reducing the amount of opportunities that the other person has to actually get help or engage with other people or find some support. So social's uh, um, one that we are very aware of. Um, the cultural spiritual side of things, um, I talked earlier about this particular group of men. Uh, I've spoken earlier about the way that we can use scriptures or tradition, uh, our church tradition or our faith tradition, to justify domestic and family violence. One of the things that I was, um, that I, I'm very aware of is having had conversations with many people over the years where they've used scripture passages to justify acting in particular ways towards their children or their wife or their husband. Um, many years ago, I was with a particular group um, from Pacific Islands, I won't say which group. And um, I remember watching, uh, especially the mums, the, the females, and they'd get this look in their eye and they'd just look at their child and like that, the child would stop. And at one stage, I thought, oh, I wish I had that that look. My mum's a, my mum was a teacher, so I've got the teacher's look. You know, I know her look. Um, but I looked at this and I thought, oh, I'd love to do that. And then I saw the response of the children. I thought, Actually, I don't want to do that. I don't want to have that particular look because it, the intimidation of the young people was something that I, thought, I, I don't want to have that. And I don't want to act in that kind of way towards young people. There are other looks I might raise an eyebrow, you know, like a really? Um, but uh, I think each cultural group has different nuances and you know your own group very well. I'm country born and bred. And so I know and understand the country side of things better than I do some of the city stuff. Uh, but it, it becomes a challenge. It's also interesting from the spiritual perspective um, in, I've been involved in many, many different congregations having worked in presbyteries, et cetera. And I know in one congregation, um, it was a farming, like a rural background. And this particular day, a couple had come and, and it must have been church or something. And I noticed that she had a bruise on the side of her eye. And I just, in my naivety, I just said, oh, you know, did so-and-so hit you? You know, the joke. And then I saw her face and realized, oh, this isn't a joke. He has actually hit you. But then how at that stage didn't really know how to respond except I did find time at one stage to quietly say to her if ever you want to have a short a conversation with me just ring me I'll find a way to get to you but it was just one of those jokes you know, oh you know did your husband get you or was it the fridge and then her response told me it was actually the husband uh, and so spiritual abuse by clergy um, happens in all sorts of ways. Um, and as a female minister, irrespective of the fact I've been ordained for a very long time now, I often will have people using scriptures, etc., about um, you shouldn't be doing this because you're a woman. Spiritual abuse by clergy can use the scriptures and tradition in a way to 
narrow the understanding of who's right and who's wrong and perpetuate gender inequality, perpetuate um, a whole range of other things. For example, um, some of the uh, abuses that happened in America in relation to the Ku Klux Klan actually came out because of the understanding of lead, church leaders, uh, ministers, and the way that they understood scriptures. So spiritual abuse can come about. Um, I've also seen it where, and heard enough stories of ministers that have met with couples that have been in situations of domestic family violence, where the minister has supported, um, in the, these stories, the male, um, to basically say, well, you're the head of the house and she has to submit to you. And they've used particular scriptures to justify the abuse that's happening. And so I've seen and heard that happen. Uh, and of course, um, particular scriptures that are used are very selective. And the one about, um, and the one about submit, wives submit yourselves to your husbands, mm -hmm. that's used repeatedly, but they forget the next little bit, husbands submit yourselves to, to um, you know, as to Christ and to be Christ-like and Christ wasn't abusive towards an intimate partner or a family member. So scriptures are used sadly in horrible, horrible ways. Um, one of the things that I think is um, recognising that um, some of the stories I've heard have been when people have gone to their minister or pastor for help, um, seeking help, and they've been told, no, not this wording, but basically you've got to suck up, suck it up. This, this is what you've, this is your role in life. This is what you have to do. This is what a good wife will do. And uh, so unfortunately, what can happen in that kind of case is that that's also limiting the kind of support that um, people actually need. So for those of us in congregations, it can be really, really difficult when we have a family in our context that we know is in a situation of domestic family violence and how we can support the whole family is really, really difficult uh, because our human nature will often tend to get us to want to go one way or the other. In, traditionally, it's tended to be in support of the male in the situations of the male, female. Um, and that's been a cultural societal thing rather than actually reading the scriptures and understanding the scriptures in a better way. So church and faith can be used to perpetuate abuse, but it can also be used as a way of challenging people about their attitudes and the way that they deal with each other. Because love does not equal hitting someone. Love does not equal restricting someone. Love does not equal dominating over another person. And so there is the weaknesses in faith, but there are also some strengths. And the resource that I'll show you in just a little while uh, actually has some really, really helpful resources to look at. Too many for me to put in this. Um, stalking is something that we're more aware of, and it happens in a multitude of ways. And this is an increased um, number of call outs that police are involved in in relation to stalking. Um, but number nine, the technology facilitated abuse um, is the one that's picked up in stalking. It's picked up in a whole range of different ways. Technology can be um, monitoring financial activities online, online banking. It can be um, checking out someone's phone. One of the ads in the last couple of days was, uh, you know, I, I keep checking his phone. You know, um, and, and or you know, uh, we use phone technology to to see who they've been in contact with. So those of us that work with in domestic family violence situations are very very careful how we give contact details to the particular person that's come for assistance. For them to have a business card could be absolutely devastating for them. 
for them to even have a um, phone contact or a phone number stored on their phone. Who's this person? What are you doing with them? How are they involved? And, and so we have to be really creative in some of the ways that we're able to connect with people. And so technology, there's a whole heap of apps that can track where someone's going nowadays. Um, and the list just goes on. The more technology that happens, the, the more creative people can be, get. But in saying that, um, those of us that are trying to work with people coming out of domestic family violence situations can also get pretty creative. Um, one family situation, um, every time this particular woman went out on garbage night, because it was her job to put the garbage out, she would take the garbage out, but in that garbage would be an extra bag that had some, some clothes or something else that was needed. Um, one stage, I think she managed to get passport and some documents out in this extra um, bag that she put in the garbage bin. And what she did was she had a bit of a signal with her neighbour and the neighbour would put her bin out at the same time and then have a little chat and then what had happened is as the woman went back in because the husband's watching her you know to see what she's saying and then as she came back in and the husband's turning to her the neighbour would very quickly lift the bin get the bag out and store the bag the husband would then go out and check the garbage bin to make sure it was just the rubbish but little bit by little bit, this woman had managed to get enough things out for her to be able to then leave. Uh, so quite creative in some of the ways that people can be involved. Um, there's a number of YouTube clips about some of the creative ways that people have been able to get help, including um, calling up triple zero and pretending that they're ordering a pizza for dinner. And the triple zero operators are aware of some of the things that they need to be working through and some of the key questions they need to ask um, to be able to get help to people in situations of domestic family violence. So again, technology can be used to limit and to control, but it can also be used in some helpful ways as well. But we're seeing more and more and more of this as a, as a form of abuse. Um, the, I'm wanting to slip through this fairly quickly. Um, Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders, I've already said that this group is one of the highest, um, the most vulnerable groups at the highest risk. Um, and it's not just the physical and sexual violence, but look at the hospitalisation, 35 times more likely to end up being hospitalised. That's horrible. Uh, we've already briefly mentioned the, um, the call to communities and uh, it's really challenging. I'm working in my context with a lot of people from Indian background and in a lot of the situations it's arranged marriages and with the arranged marriages there's a high incidence of domestic family violence and so trying to find ways of being able to help people has been really quite, quite creative, challenging and difficult especially because for many of the women, it's mainly the women, um, this is their lot in life. This is the way that they're made to see, this is the way it is, to not even question that such behaviour is inappropriate. Same gender relationships, we really don't have good statistics in relation to this, but we do know that domestic family violence does happen in same gender relationships, irrespective of whether it's female, female or male, male. We know that this happens and we know that like any relationship between two people, under certain pressures, it, people are more at risk. Women with disabilities um, are even at greater risk and often in a situation, the person that's abusing them is also their carer. And in COVID-19, um, I've been reading a number of articles recently and we're actually looking at a tsunami of reports following on from some of the, the lifting of the COVID-19 restrictions. There's been a reduced number of reporting in some areas because people have not had access to be able to report, um, but we are expecting a, a tsunami. And as I've already said, pregnancy or within 12 months of birth. And there's a whole range of other reasons about that. Um, but very, very sadly, 
this is one of the major contributions to the homelessness that happens. And of course, in pregnancy and within that first 12 months of birth, um, women in particular are very tied to that child and that particular situation. So they're even more vulnerable. So some of the strategies is really about trying to inform people. And in the lifeline situation, we talk about, um, I've got this back, I've got this wrong, um, to recognise, um, to respond, and then to refer. I didn't have the recognise in this slide, sorry about that. So first of all, we need to have the information to be able to recognise it. Then we need to know how to respond. And then we need to know where to refer. And of course, um, the resources is an important part of that. So by doing something from today, you can start to pick up some of the um, ideas about what domestic family violence is, that it's not just the physical violence and, and see things. Dulcie, you'll need to unmute yourself. Uh, still muted. Yep. Oh, sorry. Um, there was one other uh, group that I th thought perhaps should be on that list, and that's uh, elderly, elderly relatives. Mm. Often, uh, you know, yeah, are, are abused by their their carers who can be family. Yeah, and senior abuse. Um, is a whole other category, subcategory that comes in under domestic and family violence. Um, but, you know, we, could, we can continue to expand that list because you are exactly right. Any vulnerable person, and we are all vulnerable at some point in time, is at risk of domestic family violence, especially if the power dynamic changes. Mm -hmm. And um, we see that across the board. We see that with seniors. Uh, there's a whole other training session that we could do about senior abuse and how we can deal with that. And of course, um, domestic family violence comes in, in to that situation as well. But you're exactly right with that, Dulcie. Um, so recognising is something, sometimes it's only your gut feeling. Sometimes you might say something like I did, it's a bit of a joke, oh, was it your husband or the fridge? And it's the person's reaction that will start to go, oh, something else is going on here. But when we recognise it, and especially in the church situation where we're in this continuous relationship with people, um, we're able to do some follow-up. One lady, um, and I'm acutely aware of the time, so I want to keep this story short as we move towards finishing up. One lady was coming to the cafe, and every time she went to the toilet... Um, I'd have to go back into the kitchen. Uh, oh, I'd have to go to the toilet as well, wouldn't I? So that we could have conversations in the toilet as we started to make a plan for her to, to escape the situation of domestic family violence. And so because this was an ongoing relationship with this particular woman, we had to be quite creative as to where we had conversations that was out of his hearing. Um, but... I was acting with her in one way of trying to provide support for her, to educate her, and for her to find ways um, to be more resilient in re her relationship. The fact that she survived for so long was amazing. But likewise, when I was dealing with the man, um, a lot of the conversations that we were having were in a more general sense of how we need to respect each other and all people are equal and all are made in the image of God. And so I'm trying to reinforce this sense of we all should be acting in a way of power with each other. So there were different ways of dealing with the different family members because we're in continual relationship. Uh, to call him out would not necessarily have helped the situation, but she was able to get some specialist support. And the role of those of us within the church was to continue to be the support that we could be when we could be and to help her know that we understood and to continue to challenge and change the culture within the church so that he was challenged to think about his behavior towards other people 
and, and I know that there were some sermons that were very pointed um, about how we how we act towards each other. Um, I know, uh, and um, it was interesting because there were a few times when I'd preach on particular scripture passages very pointedly, uh, and the woman would uh, she'd sit there with a with her um, head down, but with the hand that he couldn't see, the, the little thumb would come up. And I knew she was understanding what we were trying to do. So with the continued relationship we, which we have in the church, we do need to be mindful that we're called to be there for everyone. But we also have some really, really good resources available for uh, the people who are using violence against intimate partners and families and to help them understand themselves better and to why they are using power and violence, because it is a choice, okay? They choose not to do it in other places. They choose to do it at home. So it's not that they can't, that they can't stop doing it. They can stop doing it. But it's about how do we educate, how do we change culture that will actually challenge um, these inappropriate behaviours within the, the church culture, as well as finding helpful resources and support for the people who are experiencing it. So pretty much the last video, uh, the last slide that I want to show you is, um, I thought I got this all right. Uh, oh, a couple more. So not everyone can do this general workshop. You need to be connecting in with people who are with domestic family violence. So if you're a chaplain or a church worker, or like you, Robin, a, a pastor, or Sharon and Sam, and et cetera, um, ministers, pastors, those kinds of people, we can do this. It's a free workshop. Um, at the moment, there's a challenge because of COVID-19, but I do encourage you to do this. It's a two-day workshop and it's very helpful. Um, we're hoping to be able to get this workbook and a, a, um, workshop out in the sum time next year, probably, for congregations to have a little bit more of an understanding and for more of the resources. And this resource, if, if you're going to go anywhere, go to this resource, saferresource.org.au. This has so many resources and ideas for us in relation to Bible studies, culture within church, um, how to understand more of domestic family violence, who are some of the places and people that we can connect with, what are some of the stories, uh, so this particular resource is a really, really valuable resource for those of us from a faith perspective. And so I do encourage you to find that. It's very easy to find and very easy to access online. And, and what it does is, to me, gives us hope that we're actually able to speak in and act into situations where we can recognise domestic family violence when it's happening. Um, and thank you, Min and for people to realise that we can recognise, we can respond, making sure that safety is one of the key issues and, and working out who we can talk to to develop better skills at responding and we can refer. And so 1-800-RESPECT uh, is one of the key things to recognise um, and that safer resource is a really helpful resource. Um, so I. We've come to the end of our time. I'm hopeful that this has got you to think in different ways. It's maybe given you some places to go. Um, I'm more than happy to have other conversations with people at different times. So if you want to unmute, is there anything else that people wanted to, um, to say or to do? And, and thanks for the, the claps or the thumbs up. Um, but this is really a taster for a whole range of other things that we're hoping to be able to bring in and to be able to talk into uh, the situation of the church and how we can actually begin to bring culture change and to proactively um, engage with domestic and family violence. So any comments, any questions? And, and those that need to leave, please just leave when you're, when you're able to. Thank you very much. I do appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. It's been wonderful. Good. Thanks, Thank Christine. Yeah. Thank you. And I'll, I'll get the recording. Mel will have access to that and she will email out the, um, the 
PDF of the PowerPoints. Once I change a couple of things that um, yeah. a couple of things I didn't have that I wanted to have in that way. Thanks. Okay. Thank you. All the Thanks. best. Love Thanks, meeting Christine. you and go well. Yeah. Thanks, Bye. Christine. I heard what I could hear and stayed as came in and out as I need, as what happened. But anyway, it yeah. is what it is. Well Thank done. You. I, I was in a I was in a meeting last week and we had a blackout and I'm hot spotting through the phone and I kept dropping in and out and it was just really crazy. But anyway, technology helps, but it's not always helpful. That's true. So, Thank you. Okay. Thank you. And thanks everyone for your contributions. Bye. Bye. Bye.